Ho ho ho, chase ghosts, come with me, watch out, demons are coming, run, sleep, hide, spirits, run, ghosts, ghosts, hide, demons, ho ho, ghosts, demons are coming. Welcome home, my little hellhound. Mr. Hellhound is here to supply you with all of your hellish nightmares. Before we begin, consider supporting the channel and check out all the new merch, everything from apparel to iPhone cases. I'll leave the link in the description. Now I have the shameless plug out of the way. Tonight we have three scary stories to sink our hellish teeth into. If you have any scary stories you want narrated on the channel, then submit them to reddit r slash home of scares. Also if you like this content then don't forget to subscribe and click the like button and turn on the bell icon so you get notified every time I upload. Now let's get right into it. Please don't leave your kids alone at the hotel pool. Posted by MTP6921. We arrived at the Yosemite Inn and Suites on July 1st at 4 pm, and I was exhausted from driving 300 miles from the Mojave Desert. My 11 and 12 year old daughters wanted nothing more than to jump in the pool where my wife and I wanted to just lie down in the room. In the past as long as the neighbourhood seemed okay and there were no CD characters in the pool then we would just let the girls go alone in the pool. So my wife Gina and my daughters Grace and Samantha and I went to the pool that appeared to have no one that would cause the girls any harm. There was just a couple that looked to be in their early 70s. The older guy didn't even look at the girls when we walked into the pool area or even when the girls stepped into the pool. So I felt pretty safe that he wasn't a creep. We exchanged a few niceties with the couple where they told us they were from Boston and we both commented about the dry heat that was in the hundreds that didn't seem that bad without any humidity. I told the girls we were in room 105 and the older couple said they were in room 205 which had a nicer view of the wilderness which I agreed since our room overlooked the parking lot. Gina and I went to the hotel room and about half an hour later, the girls came to the room. Hopefully, they put on enough sunscreen because I didn't want to hear them complaining about a sunburn tomorrow. Fortunately, there were no sunburns and in the morning, we had our free continental breakfast. The hotel staff were courteous and gave us a few tips about Yosemite Park. We drive an hour to Yosemite and the hike to see the Yosemite Falls was breathtaking. After Yosemite, we drive to San Francisco where we all were too tired from the hike. So we went to the hotel and got a takeout dinner and went to bed. We stayed in San Francisco for a few days where we went to Alcatraz and a few other popular sites. A few days later, we headed to the airport and got to Philadelphia six hours later. 
we were all too happy to be home and Gina posted her photos of the trip on Facebook. Life back at our Philadelphia suburb went back to normal where the girls had to stay home for a week until day camp started while Gina and I worked. The first day back we didn't want to cook so we got takeout and the next day we were happy to have our own cooked pasta after eating out for so long. Ted, where's the cooking pot? Gina asked me. It must be in the bottom cupboard with the rest of the pots and pans. No, I looked in there, it's not there. I remember, we used a big pot before we left for our trip where I hand washed it and put it back so it would be impossible if it wasn't there. Well, it's not, look. After moving around the various pots and pans, I say, that's really odd. We had that pot for the past 15 years, ever since we got married. My parents got it for us as a wedding gift. What do you think happened to it? I don't know, but let me go ask the girls if they know anything. They're both in the living room watching TV, I said. Girls, have you seen the big pot that we cook with sometimes? No, I haven't, Samantha said. No, sorry dad, I haven't seen it either, Grace said. I walked back into the kitchen and told Gina, while we both scratched our heads in confusion. Do you think we should call the police? Gina asked. I don't know, they'll probably laugh at us for calling them for something that has about a 50 cent depressitated value. It's not the cost of the pot that I care about, it's the fact that someone must have come into our house and took it. When? When we were in the west coast. Is there anything else missing? I ask. Nothing obvious. All the TVs are still here and obviously the furniture. Though I clearly remember returning the pot to the cupboard after washing and drying it. You never know, maybe I inadvertently did something with it. Like what? I don't know. Threw it away in the garbage or something else. Well, don't you remember when we came through the door when we got home from the airport and I said that we should have taken the small amount of garbage out because the house smelled? Yeah, I know it would be in the garbage can in the kitchen if I had thrown it out. I'm just giving suggestions. Gina looks like she is at her wit's end, where she is either about to cry or start to yell. Let's just forget about it and use two smaller pots, I suggested. So that's what we did, and we cooked and ate pasta. Gina and I did the dishes, and we retired for the night. The girls played on their phones for a little bit, and we all went to bed. Where's the remote? I asked Gina. Did you look under the pillows? Yes, I searched the whole bed. Well, it's not on the dresser or on our nightstands. What about under the bed? Okay, let me look. After looking around under the bed, I didn't see the remote. No, I don't see it. Ted, I'm calling the police. Because we're missing a remote. Yes, they'll either laugh at us or arrest us. Ted, the pot is missing and now the remote. I know, but that's not something that someone would steal. Somebody was in our house. That's why I'm calling the police. Based on? The pot missing and now the remote. Gina, people have been joking about missing remotes ever since the remotes were invented. Yes, the missing pot is strange, but the remote will reappear eventually. Ted, the remote isn't in this room. Look around, there's no place for it to hide. Well, maybe one of the kids took it, and they're sleeping now, so I don't want to ask them. Ted, their TV is different than ours. Our remote won't work on their TV, and they know that. I know, Gina. But maybe they took it anyways, thinking that it would work. Okay, whatever. Then let's just go to sleep. We went to sleep and Gina and I went to work as normal. The kids aren't going to camp this week and are staying home. 
so we gave them a list of chores to do that maybe they'll do but maybe not when we got home from work both Jean and I were surprised that the girls did the laundry however we were a little disappointed that they didn't fold the clothes we didn't say anything to them for we didn't think it was such a big deal Grace our oldest daughter asked me to enter the password on her phone because of the parental controls on her iPhone so she could download an app to play a game I agreed for her to download the app so I took her phone and I inadvertently hit the phone icon on her cell phone I noticed that Grace had a phone call from Delaware where the phone call lasted 63 minutes at 11am Hey Grace, who were you talking to from Delaware? Oh, that was just your friend, Diane. I don't have a friend named Diane. Don't you remember Diane? Your friend that you ran into at the pool at the Yazamite Hotel? No, I don't. The older man Jack and his wife Diane, who you were talking with before you and Mom went back to the room. You mean that old couple that I briefly spoke with that said they were from Boston? Yeah, aren't you friends with them? No, i never seen them before in my life. Well, Diane said she stayed in our house for a few days. What? Yeah, she said you made arrangements with them so they could stay here while we were in California. No, I said no such thing. I have no idea who those people are. Well, they stopped by while you were at work to get some of their remaining things. What the hell is going on? You let them in the house. Why would you do that? And why wouldn't you tell us? Dad, they were talking to me and Samantha like you were old friends. And they told us at the pool that they would probably see us when we got back home. Oh my God, this is horrifying. Did you give them our phone number and address at Yosemite? How did they get your cell phone number? No, me and Samantha didn't tell them anything. We would have told you if they were asking for our address or our phone number. Well, how did they find out where we lived and how did they get your phone number? Well, Diane called our home phone and the reception was bad, so I gave her my cell phone number. Gina, come here. What? I'm just finding out that the old couple who I barely said more than hi to at the pool when we were at the Yosemite Hotel were actually in our house with the girls earlier today and probably stayed here while we were in California. What? I know it sounds crazy, but somehow they got our address and possibly our phone number but they may have gotten our phone number once they were in the house I said to Gina this is a joke right? no I know this is the craziest thing I ever heard I wonder why they stayed here and what if anything they took from us I'm calling the police I called the police and they were reluctant to come over at first but once I said those strangers were in our house when we weren't home then they agreed that what they did was considered breaking and entering and sent a detective Murphy to our house to get our information before the detective came to our house I called the Yosemite Inn and Suites to try to get more information hello Yosemite Inn and Suites Yes, I stayed here on the 1st of July at your hotel and something really strange happened where I briefly met an older couple in your pool area and they somehow stayed in our house uninvited while we were still in California. Wow, sir, that does sound really strange. How do you know that it was them who stayed at your house? They actually came over when our daughters were home alone. I remember that they said they were staying in room 205 which was easy to remember because we stayed in room 105 well I can tell you that we don't have a room 205 
seriously. Well, how did they get into the pool area? Sir, sometimes the door to the pool doesn't close all the way, or sometimes people inadvertently let non-guests into the pool area. Okay, whatever. Well, how did they get our address? I have no idea, sir. Did you tell them your room number? I told my daughters and maybe they overheard our room number. Did one of your daughters tell them your last name? I didn't ask them that. What would that have made a difference? I'm just guessing, but if your daughters didn't tell them your address, then perhaps the older couple came up to the lobby desk and pretended to be you and somehow got your address. Wouldn't they have had to show proof of ID before the hotel clerk would give any information out? Well sir, I would say yes. But perhaps the couple said the right thing to avoid showing identification. But I'll put an incident report in to try to get more information. Okay, do you think you'll be able to find out if any employee gave away our information? Probably not, because even if an employee didn't follow the right protocol by not asking for ID, that same employee probably won't admit that they did that. Do you have security cameras in the lobby? We do, but we only keep the recordings for three days. Okay, great, thank you. I hung up the phone, frustrated. Then Detective Murphy came over and I told him everything that I knew. Besides the pot and remote missing, Gina also noted a few of our personal photographs missing, which we were equally as dumbstruck by as our remote and pot missing. I followed the detective's advice and cancelled all of our credit cards, and I monitored my retirement and other investment accounts to make sure no unauthorised transfers would occur. The girls could only give a vague description of what they looked like for the police sketch artists. So Diane and Jack looked like every other grey-haired couple. Detective Murphy said he would contact us if he heard anything additional. Diane's call from New Jersey came from a burner phone, which wasn't any help to the detective. The detective isn't sure how they got into our house, but I may have left the basement door unlocked. We heard nothing new after a couple of weeks, but I noticed something really disturbing while we were eating dinner tonight. As I looked up into the chandelier above the dining room table, I saw a small hidden camera. The 24-hour Disney monorail in Purgatory Posted by MTP6921 As I sit in my dark, dank, dreary apartment in the sometimes good and the sometimes bad neighbourhood of Philadelphia where I reside I wonder what a degenerate that I have turned into I have to pay alimony and child support every month to kids that I don't even see. I'm just a prime example of someone who once had everything which wasn't good enough and now I have nothing. I once was living in a desirable suburb making 90k a year married to a wife who would do anything for me. However, I just wanted more, more money and more women. Eventually my wife had caught on to my lifestyle and exposed me every way possible to the point where I even lost my job. As I look back now, I just had a compulsive and impulsive personality, almost like a gambler, where I always looking for the next high. 
The women never meant anything to me. They were just a temporary high I was getting, where my mind needed more and more. I look back at my behavior with shame now, as I know that no one will have sympathy for me. I try to focus on the good times that I had with my now estranged family when we used to go to Disney World twice a year. I can't stop thinking about my two girls, innocent faces, when they were mere toddlers, as they would first walk into the Magic Kingdom. As hard as it is to remember those happy days, I now realize that they are just faded memories, as my now 11 and 12 year old daughters probably don't even think about me. Regardless, I have saved up extra money for my delivery job and I have decided to take a solo trip to Disney World, flying with Spirit Airlines and staying at one of Disney's cheapest hotels is my only option. I packed a few of my things for my two day trip and headed to the airport. My flight was uneventful and I used Disney's complimentary bus service to take me to the hotel. At the hotel I was starting to feel depressed being by myself so I headed to the Magic Kingdom at around 1pm. Even though I didn't have to, I decided to take the monorail for no other reason than for nostalgia. I got on the monorail at the Magic Kingdom and right away I had a storm of memories that bombarded my head. All I can picture are my daughters when they were really little being mesmerized by the different sights and sounds while riding the monorail. My ex-wife Gina and I would joke how we didn't even need to go into the park because the girls loved the monorail so much. I couldn't stop crying from all of the happy thoughts that I was having. It's just so painful because I still love Gina so much but she doesn't want anything to do with me anymore. It's like I have to go through all the stages of grief but my mind can never get to the end because she's still alive. It's such a horrible feeling and I can't even get therapy because I really can't afford it. It just seems like every stop and turn the monorail makes, I see another image of the three of them as my daughters get progressively older. I'm too overwhelmed with emotions to get off the monorail as I can't stop crying. I just can't stop hearing the voices of my daughters saying, Dad, Dad, can we do the train when we get inside the Magic Kingdom? Or, Dad, I really want to see the new princess. Over and over in my head. What makes things even worse is that I see other families get on and off the monorail at each stop. I've been on the monorail for so long now, as it starts to get dark. I no longer have any desire to get off as I'm constantly flooded with memories. The monorail keeps going and going at its various stops at the different resorts. I get images of my family at each resort that we pass by. I remembered when we stayed at the Polynesian Lodge and my daughters were wearing Hawaiian reefs while they were pretending to do the luau as we waited for the monorail. I just can't stop crying. As the monorail keeps on going and going, I feel like I'm in a state of purgatory. As I constantly keep judging myself, why did I do it, why? I say out loud, as no one else is around me. In fact, no one has been around me for some time now. It's just been me riding for hours and hours by myself which I'm starting to feel is extremely odd because Disney World is always packed no matter what day or month it is. I think to myself with confusion as the monorail keeps going and going. The odd thing is that I'm more overtaken with memories than I am with concern regarding why nobody has gotten on the monorail for hours. To make things even odder, I can see the sunlight start to come out. For now I know that I was on the monorail all night long. 
I tried looking at my cheap Android cell phone, but I can't get any service and the time seems to be stuck at 12 a.m. I am not hungry or thirsty as I'm just here, sitting alone, as the monorail keeps going and going, was doing system checks or some kind of maintenance last night as I try to hypothesize why it never stopped. The early morning guests start to come on the monorail as the families were too wrapped up in their own lives to even notice me. I feel like I'm just a forgotten person in a nursing home that nobody remembers or cares that I'm alive. The monorail continues to go around its predetermined loop stopping at the transportation centre or at the different resorts around the Magic Kingdom. Any time a family with young girls comes on to my monorail car, I just get sadder and sadder. I understand why Gina won't talk to me, but I can't understand why my daughters want nothing to do with me. A couple of months ago, I purposely went to the supermarket in the suburb where I used to live, and I saw my daughters talking to Gina's new boyfriend, which broke my heart. And to make matters even worse, my daughters walked right past me at one point where they didn't even notice me. It's such a horrible feeling to know that if I was to develop a serious heart problem or be diagnosed with cancer, that my ex-wives and kids wouldn't even care. The four of us would have had such a good time at Disney whenever we went in the past and I really thought I was being a good father by taking them twice a year to Disney so I don't understand why they can't even acknowledge me anymore as the monorail continues to go I feel like I have hit a dead end in my life I have no energy to move and I don't care if I ever return home or get fired from my job as I sit on this monorail Time goes on and on. The days turn into night and the nights turn into days. Nobody acknowledges my existence as this monorail never stops. All I'm seen as is one less space for a family to sit down. I feel so helpless without any energy to even stand up when a pregnant woman has to stand while I sit. My mind goes back and forth of thoughts of why this monorail car continually goes without ever stopping for the night and what was and could have been between my family and I. From midnight to the early morning seems to be the hardest where the monorail car is completely empty besides myself which gives me plenty of time to reflect on what could have been if I had never cheated on my wife. I'm really paying the ultimate penalty of experiencing this purgatory on earth where I'm constantly reminded of what once was a time continues to go on and on. I can't recall how many Christmases I have sat through on this monorail as I overhear the parents ask their kids if they got anything they wanted or even how many Halloweens that they have went by as I see kids dress up in non-Disney, scary related costumes. I'm like a bear that is in hibernation, as how I figure that I can just sit here without eating or drinking anything. I'm just looked at as though I'm a homeless person on the street, where a parent wants to get away from the homeless person as quickly as possible, so no potential harm comes to their kids. I could tell Christmas time is starting to come around again as the outside of the Magic Kingdom is decorated in green and red. Christmas time is a reminder to me of my perpetual loneliness, whether if I'm sitting in this monorail or when I was sitting in my, in my apartment by myself. I'm constantly reminded in how I got caught up in the feelings of powerfulness where my wife's feelings meant nothing to me and how I would do anything now if she or my daughters would just give me the time of day and say hi to me. The sun comes out again as the monorail makes its way 
to the Polynesian resort. As I sit with my head down, I hear people talk about the different gifts they got and what rides they will go on at the Magic Kingdom. Also, I can hear these adults talk about how very little has changed with the monorail and the Polynesian resort from when they used to come here years ago. I hear this same group of people laugh and reminisce in how they would walk around all day in the park with the Hawaiian reefs in the sweltering heat. I started to get vivid flashbacks of my daughters as I hear this group of people reminiscing about their past. I started to cry when I heard one of them say, I used to beg my father to buy me one of those light up toys until he would eventually cave in and buy it for me. And when the other person said, yeah, do you remember when we used to walk around with those huge balloons? As I sit and sob, I can't control my emotions, as this morning my cries are more audible than usual where people actually look at me. What's the matter? I hear a woman's voice say over to me. Nobody has acknowledged me for some time, so it doesn't compute with me that they're actually asking me. Excuse me, sir. Is everything okay? The same woman's voice says again. This time I slowly raise my head and I hear, Oh my God, as if someone had just won the lottery or was told that they were pregnant. Dad, is that you? I haven't talked in so long that my mouth moves but nothing comes out. I see my daughters are all grown up now, probably about 20 and 21 years old, respectively. I also see my ex-wife, who says, Ted, oh my gosh, what are you doing here? I haven't seen or heard from you in a decade. I'm just so overtaken with emotions that I can't say anything as I continue to cry. I see the stop coming for the Magic Kingdom and I start to realise that they will get off and continue with their lives and maybe tonight one of them will say, I can't believe we saw him on the monorail. The three of them continue to look at me as I am speechless. I want to tell my wife that I was sorry and I want to tell my daughters that I have missed them all so much as the monorail stops at the Magic Kingdom. I look at the three of them like a dog who is so sickly and old that he knows that he is about to be euthanized, but still stares at his owners like, please don't. As the monorail doors open, something truly amazing happens where the three of them don't get off the monorail at the Magic Kingdom and instead they stay with me. Eventually I utter, I'm sorry over and over again. It's okay dad, we missed you. My ex-wife even sat down next to me as we both looked at each other in the eyes wondering what could have been. A school bus that dropped off a boy at the wrong house posted by MTP 6921 it's 2 30 p.m. and my usual routine of starting to make dinner is under the way which isn't difficult considering I'm only cooking for myself tonight I decided on making homemade baked macaroni and cheese which I just put in the oven as I was going to turn the oven up a few degrees, I can't help but notice an unfamiliar sound in front of my house. It almost sounds like the garbage truck, but today is Tuesday, so I say to myself that it can't be. Heavens no, I say out loud as I see a boy outside of my kitchen window, no older than eight years old, get off the bus and head towards my house. I quickly head towards my front door, located in my kitchen, and open the door. Hi Grandma, the little boy says to me. I'm left completely tongue-tied, as I have no children, and for some reason this boy is calling me Grandma. 
It's unusually cold outside, so I let him inside. The boy has a certain comfort level and takes his sneakers off like he has been in my house before. Then he walks towards my living room and sits on the couch. I have no frame of reference on how to respond to a situation like this and I don't want to scare him, so I say, how was your day today? It was good, the boy responded. How's your mum? I asked. She's fine, the boy replied. Do you know how you're getting home? No, mummy didn't tell me, the boy replied. I'm fairly certain that I should call 911, but I'm also taken aback on the comfort level this boy has in my house. Being a single older woman, I'm also a little weary that something malicious might be going on like I might be getting scammed, but I don't know for sure yet. I really don't know what to ask, so I say, do you want me to get you something? Macaroni and cheese, the boy replied. That response pretty much made me stop dead in my tracks, for I thought to myself, how did this boy know I was cooking macaroni and cheese? Why did you ask for macaroni and cheese? I asked. Because that's what I always ask for, the boy replied. That's what you always ask for. When? I asked. When I come here. That statement really shook me to my core because there was no more beating around the bush. This boy thinks he knows me and he thinks he's been here before. But why choose this house? Did his mother write a note for the bus driver to drop him off here? Do they know I live alone and are using this boy to scope out my house? Now, I can't recall the last time I decided to bake macaroni and cheese, maybe two years ago. When I was watching Martha Stewart, I really don't recall what compelled me to make it today. But more importantly, I keep asking myself, who is this boy? Ever since I retired from the post office, my days have been filled with nothing more than reading Reddit stories or watching cooking shows. It's not really how I envisioned my life would be, but case Sarah Sarah. I keep trying to tell myself, let me go check on the macaroni and cheese, I say to the boy. I go to the kitchen and say that it's ready to be taken out of the oven. So I put some mac and cheese on a plate and bring it to the living room. The boy is put on the TV and is watching Woody Woodpecker. Oh, you like watching this cartoon, I ask. Yeah, it's my favourite, the boy responds. At that moment, I'm taken back to a time in my life where I thought my life would have went in a different direction. A time when I used to run around like I am now fetching mac and cheese. You don't like watching Spongebob or Pokemon, I asked. Sometimes I do, but my mum doesn't like me watching those shows too much and we both watch Woody Woodpecker together, the boy explains. My eyes almost start to tear up as my mind drifts back once again to a simpler and happier time when my daughter would take over the television on a Saturday morning to watch cartoons as my husband would relinquish the television and reluctantly oblige. I'm overtaken with emotions because I purposely tried to keep those memories to a minimum. Life didn't necessarily turn out the way I expected it would. The old proverbial phrase, the best laid plans of mice and men sometimes go awry, reason really resonates with me and my current situation. I turn my attention away from calling the police to first making sure this boy is okay for now as I try to pull myself together. What can I get you to drink? Strawberry flavoured milk, the boy responded. This time my brain put up warning flags that a potential scam could be occurring here because this little boy was mirroring exactly what I used to get for my own daughter. But then my brain started to question that logically. Who would know my daughter's go-to choice of favourite cartoon? her favourite food and her favourite drink. Moreover, this boy is a complete stranger to me. 
who was literally dropped off by some random bus where I was too focused on watching the boy walk towards my house then picking up on the number on the yellow bus or the actual name of the school. I go back into my kitchen in a daze. I look in the refrigerator to see if I have any strawberries to blend with milk. I look around and realise that I don't have any strawberries. Then my eyes lock onto one of my kitchen cabinets, the kitchen cabinet where I store ingredients that I don't typically use. My eyes can't turn away from the cabinet because when I was at the grocery store and I saw that Nesquik came out with its nostalgic strawberry powder tin can sometimes compelled me to buy it two weeks ago. I remembered being in the grocery store and holding the can for 20 minutes at 7am in the morning as I was one of the only customers in the store. As I held the can I remembered how my daughter used to see that same tin can in the store and say, Mummy, can I get this? Now I fully recall having that strawberry powdered mix in the house and grab it from the cabinet. I take it out and now I just can't stop crying. I go to the fridge and get the milk and pour the milk into a glass with the strawberry powdered mix. I really tried to pull myself together but I really never had an opportunity to fully understand that part of my life that was taken away from me. Before going to bring the drink to the boy, I wipe my tears. As I walk into the living room, I see the photo of me, my daughter and my husband on the wall from the late 1980s. And I remembered when this house was once bustling with happiness and joy. The boy takes the drink from my hand and says, thank you. I have been living alone for so many years now that I have forgotten what to do after I gave the drink to the boy as I stand awkwardly in the living room. I do have one pressing question that I am reluctant to ask this boy. A question that questions my own mental health but also piques my own curiosity. Is there anything else I can get for you? No, I'm okay, the boy responded. By the way, besides mom or mummy, what's your mother's name? I asked the boy. Valencia, the boy replied, after hearing the word Valencia. My brain instantaneously went into Y2K mode and was on overload because I was taken back to a time when my husband and I were on our honeymoon in Puerto Rico and we both fell in love with each other and the hotel we stayed at was called the Hotel Valencia. So much so that we named our daughter after the hotel that we both adored, Valencia. I can picture me and my husband holding hands and fast forwarding to giving birth to our daughter several years later. I can't snap out of this memory trance that I have ventured down into because there's been no one in this suburban neighbourhood with that same name since my daughter. My brain doesn't want to come back to reality because it's still processing everything this unknown boy has presented to me today. The boy finishes the glass of strawberry milk and slams it down on the coffee table almost to get my brain to stop thinking about the thought of my daughter and husband leaving the house. My brain painfully pauses and that thought and the boy uncharacteristically looks into my eyes as young boys typically don't do and says grandma I'm going to go outside and play as he gets up and leaves the house I know I will never see him again as my brain presses play again I see my husband and daughter leaving the house to never return from that car accident that took both of their lives in 1988. And that's it for 
tonight, my little hellhounds. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to check out the new merch. If you liked this content tonight, then subscribe and click that like button. And don't forget to turn on the bell so you get notified every time I upload. And follow me on Twitter at Home of Scares. And submit your stories to Reddit r slash Home of Scares. Now, good night, my little hellhounds. <laughs>